Okay. Um, so yesterday, um, we completed the introduction of uh, syllabus design, right? And as, as I told you that there are um, basically two main kinds of syllabuses, and then we can divide it into further kind. One is product-oriented syllabuses that we are going to uh, deal with today and tomorrow. And the other is um, process-oriented syllabuses of procedural uh, syllabuses that we are going to uh, do later in this week, okay? And with that, we are going to complete the syllabus also of applied linguistics. Now what happens is when we are talking about the product oriented uh, services, uh, when the focus or the objective um, of a syllabus is uh, based on some results that you know the student should uh, be able to learn this form, this particular form of the language, okay? So we are focusing on the product. Okay, what would be the final product? What would be the students uh, would do, right? Um, what skill or knowledge about the language should the student gain as a result of instruction, right? The focus is on the product. So whatever the syllabus might be, but the teacher should reach that particular product. This is called as product oriented syllabus, and we have a number of them. Okay. Um, the other is the procedural syllabuses or uh, process oriented syllabus, where the process of learning is more important than the product. Okay. What happens uh, as we start teaching or following a particular syllabus till we end it? The process is very important. Learning lies in the process, okay? So we are going to deal with that also um, uh, later on, okay? So uh, now as far as, you know, looking at the syllabus is concerned or planning the syllabus, uh, syllabus planning or syllabus designing, um, there can be many ways in which, you know, uh, when a syllabus is proposed, it can be analyzed. But uh, the two basic ones are analytic and synthetic syllabus planning, okay? Right now we are not talking about um, syllabuses per se, right? But we are talking about how um, the planning can be done, okay? So planning, as far as planning is concerned, the syllabus can be of two kinds, or syllabus planning can be of two kinds. One is analytical, the other is synthetic. Okay, just wait, let me add a few of your class fellows. Okay. Right? So, uh, these are just two dimensions, otherwise there can be many dimensions also, right? So, when we are talking about synthetic language teaching strategy or planning the syllabus through uh, synthetic syllabus planning. So that uh, uh, can be defined as uh, Wilkins 1976 defines it as a strategy uh, in which different parts of the language are taught separately. Okay, language as a whole is not taught. If you remember uh, teaching of the methods, uh, so many methods that we uh, learn about uh, language teaching or second language teaching, we found that from uh, teaching of language separately, okay, different parts of the language are taught, for instance, in grammar translation method also, in direct method, and then, you know, um, in audio lingual method, uh, specific drills are done in order to, you know, teach language, some part of the language, basically, some particular structure is taught. And until and unless that structure is uh, not completely taught, the teacher and the students cannot move to the other parts of the language. So this is called as, you know, synthetic uh, language planning or um, a synthetic language teaching strategy, where the language is taught separately, steps by steps, right? So that acquisition is a process of, you know, gradual uh, accumulation of parts until whole structure of language has been built up, okay? 
If you want to understand this in simpler terms, remember, uh, recall the drills that we studied in audiolingual method, especially. Okay, those chain drills. One, a structure, um, uh, something, one form was added to the structure. Okay, for instance, if the if the if the uh, whole sentence is, I am on campus right now. So on campus right now, am on campus right now, then I am on campus right now. So this is a backward drill, okay? One form is added so as to complete the structure and then um, till the whole structure of language has been built up and learned, okay? So this is uh, synthetic syllabus planning. So while you are designing a syllabus, um, um, of course, uh, the whole planning revolves around the objective. What do you want your students to learn and how would you, like, would you want them to learn, right? By you, I mean the syllabus designer, as we studied yesterday, that teachers usually do not have an active role in syllabus designing. These days, um, they are being given, given the freedom um, to design their own uh, lessons uh, along with the methodologies and uh, how they would implement it. So there is a bit of flexibility, but more responsibilities on the teachers. Uh, but basically, syllabus designing is done by people with um, such expertise for curriculum development and syllabus design. So what you need to know uh, that in synthetic syllabus planning, um, the methodology would be different, okay? Because the language as a whole is not taught. Language is taught in parts, right? Uh, until, you know, complete structures are taught, okay? So um, the, this um, audiolingual method and backward drill can be one of the strategies uh, as a part of methodology for the implementation of uh, a syllabus that is uh, built on synthetic uh, syllabus planning, right? Otherwise there can be other drills also, backward drill, chain drills, and there can be so many other, other drills that really depends how you know the planning is done right okay now here is your task from task 7 you are going to move to task 24 and you are going to number the task as 24 okay do not number the task as 8 right there are some people outside okay so uh, when you're uh, doing this one, this task, uh, you are going to number as 24, okay? Do not number as eight because seven of the tasks we are already done in chapter one, and this is chapter three, okay? So I hope this is clear that when you are doing the task in your um, assignments, um, just number them as they are numbered by Newman, okay? I hope this is clear to everyone. Now, um, our task 24 is, uh, this is the definition of Wilkins that, that we referred to for synthetic uh, syllabus planning. And uh, this is taken as the teaching strategy as well. So task 24 tells you that in his work, Wil Wilkins assumes that grammatical criteria will be used to break the global language down into discrete units. As I've given you example, that the best example of synthetic uh, syllabus planning is uh, grammatical syllabus, okay? Because uh, while we are following a grammar translation method or if the objective of your syllabus is to teach grammar, then you are uh, teaching uh, parts of the language, forms of the language separately, okay? For instance, one day you're teaching the tenses, all right? Um, the other day you are teaching some other form, okay? The third day you are teaching active passive, right? So you're not teaching the language as a whole. Um, you're going to create some um, artificial uh, material, uh, non-authentic as we call it, uh, for teaching that way. 
right? So now what you're going to do is, the items will be graded according to the grammatical complexity of the items, their frequency of occurrence, their contrastive difficulty in relation to the learner's first language, situation need, and pedagogical meanings, okay? So if you are um, designing the syllabus, you should be taking care of uh, these things according to Wilkins, okay? So as we defined um, syllabus yesterday, or syllabus designing yesterday, we define it as selection and grading of contents. Remember, right? So th that's your simplest definition of uh, syllabus design. So when a syllabus is being designed, uh, through this approach of uh, synthetic syllabus designing um, and uh, grammatical syllabuses are the best example that are designed in this way. So how items are selected and how are they graded? Basically, you know, you can take these into consideration. How frequently those um, forms of language are required by the students, okay? So, uh, and first of all, uh, why are the students learning uh, the language or English as a second language? In what context? Why would they need this? Okay, so accordingly, you are going to select and grade um, the grammatical items. Uh, you can look at the complexity. Okay, you may start with simpler ones and then go to the complex ones. You may start with the easier ones and then go to the difficult ones. Um, there is an ironical situation that this is not compulsory. If certain structures are simple, uh, students would learn them quickly, okay? Simple doesn't mean easy, right? Um, because then, you know, we are going to read about uh, the difference between forms and functions, okay? So that makes the situation a little complicated. And it is not necessary that the complex structures would be difficult to learn. Sometimes, complex structures are easier to learn. So there's, there's no theory in a second language teaching that proves that simpler structure would be easier to learn. But you grade um, the content of language um, according to uh, maybe complexity, according to their um, level of difficulty as you feel it, okay? According to your students, of course, okay? Or, um, you know, you look at the first language of the students as well. Um, how much interference can be from the first language, right? So the languages that are similar, for instance, you know, the European languages, um, their written transcript is quite similar. They almost use the same alphabets, okay? And uh, then their writing um, side is also similar. So when someone, um, from a European country would be learning English, it would be easier for them, okay? Because of the same alphabets also, sometimes uh, a little difference in the pronunciation, right? So if your language is similar to the, to, to the language that you're learning, um, uh, it, of course, it would be easier to learn, okay? Now, if you look at your local languages, your mother tongues or Urdu, the lingua franca, it is quite different from English, right? So um, a syllabus that would work in one situation will not work in another situation. So you can take uh, all of these into consideration. Uh, for instance, the complexity of the items, the frequency of occurrence in a language, and then the contrastive you know, difficulty uh, in relation to uh, learner's first language, okay? Uh, situational needs and uh, your own resources, the pedagogic convenience. So you design the syllabus or the syllabus should be designed for a particular uh, situation according uh, to the available resources, okay? Now, what you're supposed to do in task uh, 24 is, do you think the grammar is the only criteria for selecting and grading content in a synthetic syllabus? Do you think it is only grammar that, that, that you can select and grade the items of the language, okay? Or are there other things also? For instance, uh, would you like to teach uh, your students some 
uh, communicative skills also do you want to grade um, something uh, for the reading skills or for the for the writing skills uh, can we use this grading or synthetic system of slavers design in teaching of the other skills also or or is grammar the only criteria okay so uh, if you if you think uh, it is true also that uh, uh, you know grammar uh, is not just the only criteria for selecting and grading of content so what other criteria do you suggest okay uh, because you know uh, if the objective of your teaching uh, is teaching of some skills right then you would be grading you know, selecting and grading uh, contents from the language in a different way and not just the grammar okay you might be taking care of the vocabulary also and um, you might be taking care of uh, uh, increasing their comprehension as well a uh, few things from the communication too right um so uh, this is what you're supposed to do you have to think about it just research a little discuss in your groups if grammar is um, not the only criteria if language is not only grammar what is what else is the language about and um you would be held by the methods that we have done okay so um initially um synthetic syllabus uh, was equated with grammatical syllabuses okay but then uh you know uh, with the passage of time and development in uh, language teaching methodology applied linguistics uh, linguists came to know that you know uh, these are not equal and uh, synthetic need not necessarily be restricted to grammatical syllabuses okay so uh, those can be you know applied to any syllabus in which the content is uh, product oriented uh um, with discrete list of grammatical items and in which the classroom focus on the teaching of these items as separate and discrete okay so um there can be more parts of the language other than grammar that can be selected and then get, that can be graded for creating a syllabus under synthetic uh, syllabus planning okay um and the modern time applied linguists believe that um, the syllabus only needs to be you know product oriented but it doesn't mean that it has to be you know grammatical syllabus and later on we will find out that under product oriented syllabuses um we have the functional syllabus also okay just not the grammatical syllabus grammatical syllabus is one of the syllabuses um which are which come under product oriented syllabuses okay now let's come to uh, uh the other way of planning or other way of looking at uh, syllabus planning or syllabus designing that is analytic okay analytic syllabuses or analytic syllabus planning now these are basically organized according to the purposes for which um, people are learning the language okay and uh, the kinds of language performance that are necessary to uh, meet those purposes so basically analytic syllabuses do not have anything to do with uh, discrete teaching of uh, different forms of language okay but uh, their focus is on uh, the 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 purpose for which the learning is taking place of course uh, every teaching of english as a second language the purpose is not teaching of grammar so we cannot equate language teaching with the teaching of grammar there can be other purposes for which people might be learning a language and uh, uh 
The purpose can be language performance also, the actual use of the language, okay? So analytic syllabuses are different from synthetic syllabus because in analytic syllabus, language as a whole is taught, not um, uh, discrete forms of language, okay? Uh, just hold on. Yes, Mazib, I've, I've, uh, analytic. Okay, synthetic is dividing the language into parts. Okay, the best example is teaching of grammar. And uh, initially, teaching of grammar was equated to synthetic language planning. Analytic language planning uh, or analytic uh, syllabus designing, I would say, syllabus designing or um, syllabus planning is teaching language as a whole according to the purpose for which the students are learning the language and oftentimes the purpose of teaching and learning of the second language is more than learning of the grammar okay so uh, the focus is on the purposes and language performance if you want if you want them to be able to read uh, literature of the language, this is one of the purpose of teaching of uh, or learning of English as a second language. If they want to be communicatively competent, that's another purpose. They need to perform it. Perform it. If you want them uh, to be good at creative writing, then that's another purpose why they are learning the language. Okay, I told you that um, the purpose of learning the language really depends on the situation. Also, I gave you the example uh, of here. As we learn the language for academic purposes, okay. Um, not exactly. Um, we would we would connect it later, uh, but a synthetic and analytic are only you know how can you view syllabus planning, okay. There there are many dimensions. These are two dimensions, okay. Okay, let me, let me uh, revise it for you. Basically, there are two umbrella terms, uh, two kinds of syllabuses. One is product oriented that we are dealing in, uh, today. The other is process oriented, okay? Now, there are many dimensions as far as syllabus planning is concerned. Um, we are looking at two dimensions that are important to us. One is synthetic, the other is analytic. Okay, so synthetic, when uh, you know, when we uh, any slave uh, designer is uh, focusing on teaching of language in parts, that is synthetic language, uh, slave plan. And when the language is being taught as a whole, that is called as analytic uh, syllabus design or planning, okay? Uh, analytic syllabus planning very much depends on the purpose of language performance, okay? Because when you teach grammar, uh, the focus is on, not on language performance. By language performance, we just do not mean um, uh, communicative competence. Communicative competence can be one of the ways of language performance, but as we were doing the methods, we saw that you know sometimes the aim of teaching of uh, language can be uh, appreciation or enabling the students to read the foreign literature in that particular language, okay? So uh, uh, this is what, uh, the, these are basically dimensions, okay? And uh, product and process of procedural services are the basic kinds, right? Okay, so, so we are done with this, right? So here, what happens in analytic um, syllabus planning, the students are given chunks of language. Chunks of language means, you know, complete uh, language, 
okay language as a whole right so uh, these can include the structures also and uh, of course uh, while you are looking at the syllabus through analytic dimensions uh, you can also you know take into consideration the difficulty levels and the complexity of the structures uh, so the starting point for the syllabus design um, in an analytic syllabus is not grammatical as it is in a uh, syntactic one but communicative okay for which the language is being used right so there can be a number of purposes but basically it's the communicative purpose so um let's simplify it um, syntactic uh, dimension is about um, grammar okay basically basically grammar otherwise you know um different parts of the language can be taught okay but since we have seen grammar as uh, consisting of different parts of the language so that's one thing right so analytic syllabus it does not um, teach language separately it tries to teach language as a whole through chunks of language and the purpose is basically to um, make students uh, communicative okay or uh, bring uh, produce communicative competence in them right got it so um, you just uh, need to differentiate between synthetic as teaching of discrete forms of language and here it's about the functions of language and analytic one okay and these are the two dimensions of syllabus planning i hope this is clear now um let me add uh, see your class fellows and we can move on okay right so now that it, it is clear we are going to move towards the first kind of uh, product oriented syllabus that is the grammatical syllabus and that we are we have been doing um grammatical syllabus as you know uh, grammar translation method is the oldest method and uh, it is still in practice as i have given you example of our own place also so um similarly the most common syllabus is the grammatical syllabus okay and um it's just not that uh, it no more exists because of the failure of grammar translation method and that many of the classrooms have moved to uh, clt communicative language uh, teaching but uh, grammatical syllabus is still um, in practice okay um it is still planned grammatical syllabuses are available and they are still implemented um uh, in you know language centers also or wherever um, english is being taught as a second language okay and now what is the grammatical syllabus grammatical syllabus is such a syllabus in which the uh, contents are selected and graded especially on the basis of uh, simplicity and complexity okay so um, as i told you that the irony is that um, all complex structures are not difficult to learn and all simple structures grammatical structures are not easy to learn okay so uh, it sometimes uh, planning this grammatical syllabus uh, is a little tough uh, you must have experienced as a student also that uh, when a grammar book is handed over to the teacher to be taught in the classrooms and then there would be little disturbance because i am in, in in the staff room and someone you know uh, is cleaning the place so they are moving the furniture i hope they do not create a lot of disturbance anyway getting back here um i was giving the example of what we have experienced while we were um learning english now you must have seen that grammar books are quite thick okay 
if they are given to the teachers to teach through those books in the classroom, none of the teacher would cover it from cover to cover, okay? They would select, they would grade chapters if they are chapters or if they are sections. They're not going to start from page number one and uh, end it with the last page. So um, they cannot, uh, one thing is that they are not going to teach all the structures, they are, they are going to be selective, okay? And according to their situation, according to their students, they are going to grade the simplicity or the complexity uh, uh, of the structures, okay? What happens usually in our scenario that teachers start with the present tense, okay? They think that the present, present tense, the simple present tense or the present definite tense is the easiest, okay? Brad, but I personally felt that present continuous tense is easier, okay? But they would not teach the continuous tense before um, teaching you the present, in simple present tense, okay, or present definite tense, right? So this um, is a problem, you know, and one of the criticism as we would go on with this, we're going to discuss this in detail, that this has been the criticism that, you know, simpler structures are not necessarily, the chances are that simpler structure would be easier to learn, but then there are also chances that simpler structures are difficult to learn while some complex structures are easier to learn for the students, okay? So, uh, uh, but, uh, what is the basis of grammatical structure? What grammatical, what is the basis of grammatical syllabus and what grammatical syllabus is quite rigid about is teaching of one structure or one form or one item of the language at a time, okay? And until and unless all the learners have learned that particular item, uh, and the teacher is sure that everyone has learned one item or that particular item that was being taught, the teacher is not going to move to the next item or to the next structure or to the next form. So um, grammatical services are quite rigid, right? Uh, in terms of, you know, the requirement of mastery of one item and the teacher cannot move to the other one. Okay, so uh, the transition from lesson to lesson is intended to enable material in one lesson to prepare the grounds for the next. Okay, so, and why is it important to you know master one item or uh, one lesson? Because um, grammatical syllabuses or the designer or the planner of grammatical syllabuses they believe that uh, lessons or items are connected with one another. If the students have not mastered one form of the language, um, they cannot move to the other form. For instance, if the students are not taught present tense, they would not be able to learn the past tense. And if past tense and present tense is not learned by the student, uh, it would be impossible for the teacher to teach them the future tense or the future forms, which you know we know. Uh, which is not the case. But that is what, what is the belief of um, um, planners who work with uh, grammatical syllabuses. Okay, so um, this is the reason that mastery of one item or one lesson is important before uh, moving towards um, something else. Okay. Okay. Yes, um, Hanifa, um, uh, the example that I would give of complex structures or the structures that are considered to be complex are um, sentences with clauses, okay? Main clause and subordinate clause uh, are, uh, you know, there are, there are kinds of sentences. There are uh, simple sentences, there are um, then complex sentences as well. Okay, so what is defined as complex structures uh, or the complex sentences in English 
are those with uh, clauses and sub clauses longer sentences okay and simpler structures are just one sentence without a clause or without uh, many punctuation marks okay and if I, I i think this is clear now we are looking at you know uh this is an example mcdonald illustrates the points as follows this is lesson one okay she's happy uh, copula adjective this is copula this is adjective why right? this is a pronoun so this is lesson number one the simpler one right then um, introduction of ing form this is lesson two she is driving a car so a copula ing form and then uh, this object okay so see by simplicity we also mean um, less number of items okay so we mean a less number of items and then we keep on adding items to these okay um, then lesson three reintroduces existential there there is a man standing near the car there instead of this pronoun now we are moving towards uh, some complex sentences and we introduce here there okay so um, you can read it and you would know that um, at the end introduces adverbs of habit and thus the present simple tense or rather present tense is simple aspect i usually this is the adverb come at six o'clock okay so um this is not the standard this is just the example if you are um, planning a grammatical syllabus uh, you can add items according to the complexity that you feel okay right um now let's move to task 24 a copula is um what else do you call this is are am all of these are called as copula okay uh, we call them in simpler terms we call them helping verbs i guess okay they complete your uh, if if you know the main verb we do not find the main verb this copula acts as a verb here okay now if you know uh, if you uh, if you have done syntax or if you have done pedagogical grammar and um, you like to analyze this sentence according to the you know uh, 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 just wait okay hold on Okay, so yeah, I was telling you that this is one of the example. Ah, I was telling you about the cap, copula. Copula is, you know, uh, it can be a helping verb like it is here, but it, it is a main verb when the verb is missing. Okay, we, all, we also in simpler language call it a helping verb, right? Am, is, was, were, all of these is copula. I'm not really uh, good at grammar, but this is uh, perhaps um a copula is okay so uh let's move to task 25 okay and uh, yeah we'll 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 do the criticizing of grammatical or criticism on grammatical syllabus um, maybe tomorrow but let's do uh task 25 as we have already noted, all syllabus outlines or proposals are underpinned by assumptions about the nature of language and language learning. Okay. What assumptions about language and language learning do you imagine might underpin a grammatical syllabus of the type described above? Okay. So how would you do this? Let me tell you. Senses, tenses. Uh, Isha, do you want to say tenses? 
या रिटर्न सेंसेस हाँ टेंसेस के लिए यूज होता है कॉपीला इज यूज ओके ओके नाउ व्हाट यू सपोज टू कॉपीला वर्ब्स आर यूज फॉर सेंसेस अच्छा मे बी but i i i guess these are these are used for tenses is are am okay anyway now what are you supposed to do in um here task 5 acha ishra to saying something about the copyright i I don't know uh, if it's a grammatical. Of course, copula is a grammatical item. Nagma, do you want to say something? Uh, copula is a grammatical item, okay. And as far as uh, I know, uh, it is used for the tenses. But we can search, okay. No worries, okay. Right now, let's move to. Uh, Anil is right. See, I told you that this is a helping verb, and this is helping verb means uh, is used to connect uh, the words, right? And of course, uh, senses has nothing to do with the, with grammar, but tenses have all to do with grammar, right? You can even check this, but uh, the examples also tells you, and uh, uh, here also we get to know that this is copula, okay? combination of adjective copula and adjective is this is copula and this is adjective anyway now let's move to task 25 now uh, we have come to know that uh, while we are or anyone else is designing the syllabus we need to take into consideration the nature of language and language teaching okay so what do you think what what assumptions do you see here about language learning and language teaching um as far as this grammatical syllabus is concerned okay so you need to you know analyze this syllabus that is given to you on the basis of uh, the assumptions about the nature of language uh, nature of language and language teaching right now how are you going to do this um i tell you okay right so uh basically the assumption behind uh most of the grammatical syllabuses is that um quoting chomsky here also that language consists of finite set of rules it doesn't have infinite it has a number of rules but of course there is a finite set of rules okay and those can be combined in various ways to make meanings right for instance if we have this uh, pronoun she this would be used in so many structures okay copula would be is one of the items of grammar it can be used in several structures so we have finite set of rules okay and through those rules we can form a uh, various uh, ways of uh, structuring them uh, form different meaning okay uh, these rules uh, grammatical rules because we are right now we are dealing with grammar and grammatical syllabuses so the grammar rules can be learned and who would know better than us because we have actually uh, learn english language through learning of the gram grammar rules okay so uh, these rules can be learned and uh, each item can be mastered also okay and this uh, keeps on going on till most of the rules are learned of course all rules cannot be learned by a single person but uh, the thing is that all the rules are available all the rules are present all the rules are written because they are finite okay what 
is the basic aim of teaching through grammatical syllabus is to enable the students to crack the code. Now, what do we mean by cracking the code is to enable the student to find out which rule to apply. Okay. This is what happens when teachers uh, um, give you grammar exercises. Okay. Uh, we, we have, you know, we have already talked about, you know, um, deductive and inductive um, language teaching. So when you learn the rules, then you are given exercises to apply the rules that you have already learned. So if you are able or if your students are able to apply the right rules, that means you have cracked the code. You know how to solve the equations. Okay. So grammatical uh, syllabuses basically take language as something uh, rule governed as something mathematics. If you know the formula, you would be able to solve the exercises. Okay. That is why grammatical syllabuses uh, is focused on learning of the rules with the belief that there are finite number of rules and students can learn the rules one after the other okay and then uh, the aim is that uh, they would be able to apply those rules that they have wrote learned okay so um, Basically, the assumption is that uh, the learners would internalize all these rules, which are also called as formal aspects of uh, a given piece of language, right? And uh, they will automatically be able to use uh, it in communication outside the classroom. This is, again, I'm telling you that this is just an assumption. And as uh, we kept on, um, uh, learning those methods, we came to know that uh, learning of the rules do not make the students communicatively competent. Okay, so this remains only an assumption, and uh, you you are going to work with the assumptions, right? What is being assumed here? The person who has designed this syllabus, okay, McDonough. What are his assumptions about the language and language learning? Okay. Um, we will continue with other assumptions also, which would help you in doing of uh, this task for tomorrow at uh, uh, nine, uh, nine o'clock. Okay, uh, guys, please, uh, uh, I would like you to be a little patient because I have to reach the campus and then, you know, I have to connect to conduct this class. So it might be, you know, five to six minutes late. Um, sometimes I try not to, but um, it, it, it may happen. Okay. Okay. And now, now in your chat section, uh, still a debate is going on. What is copula? Uh, please find out uh, exactly what copula is. But as far as I know, it's um, a helping verb and it can act as a main verb in the absence of um, uh, the verb. But um, we would search and get the correct answer. Other than that, you know, we'll continue with the um, solving of this task 24 uh, tomorrow. And I hope by tomorrow we are going to complete uh, this chapter also. Okay, so I will see you uh, uh, tomorrow at 9.